the schools and the students do not understand one another. So is the official English movement really a cover for intolerance, for people who want to keep America a predominantly white Anglo-Saxon country? Jim Boulay of English First. We're talking about government recognition of languages, not the private recognition of languages. If they don't want to speak English in their private affairs and in their business affairs, that's their business. They don't have to do it. But when it comes to government business, then English is the language of government. In Arizona, where the battle lines are being drawn up yet again over a confrontation which the multilingual groups thought they'd already won, Stephen Montoya is hopeful that the Supreme Court will eventually uphold the first appeal ruling against the official English law. I'm very confident that we will continue to prevail in this case because I think a fundamental principle of American democracy as, as expressed by the First Amendment is that of free speech. I think uh, free speech includes the right to choose one's words and the language in which one speaks. This is a test case that will have considerable repercussions far beyond the state of Arizona. That report by Andy Chai. Well, with me in the Outlook studio for today's program is Nicholas Oestler, who's the president of the Foundation for Endangered Languages. Uh, I'd like to ask you first for your views uh, on this debate in the United States. Um, there are places now where Spanish seems to be more widely spoken than English, um, southern Florida's one, and of course the um, southwestern states, which uh, were previously part of Mexico, and this is a backlash against that, isn't it? It's really uh, ironic, though, that the, um, those in uh, p positions of official power feel that they have to defend English, because Spanish is traditionally and very much the language of the people who are up and coming in society who haven't made it to the top. They were certainly going to need to acquire um, English if they're going to um, play a, a major role in American society as a whole. I think um, one thing which strikes those of us who are involved in the field is that this, um, but the measure which is before the House of Representatives at the moment has been around for some months, indeed years, and didn't look as if it was going anywhere. It just looks, though, as if um, with the uh, Republicans looking for an issue which will give them some easy votes at the moment, it suddenly had a new lease of life. But isn't it also the case that uh, this has developed uh, so much that it's, it's not just fears about uh, an invasion of language, but a, a cultural invasion of the United States? I think that's, that's exactly you put your finger on it. Um, languages um, represent communities in some way, and they show people's um, affiliation in a, in a very vivid way. Um, what um, we have here is a lot of people, perhaps in the southwest of, of the USA particularly, um, concerned that their group is in some sense sliding um, in power and they're going to um, hit out to defend themselves. And it is hitting out, which is what's done, because these sort of official measures tend to do damage rather than good. They don't re result in more people learning the language. They just um, tend to result in people who were uh, doing quite well in their own language in their community not being allowed to use it in the way that they used it before. I suppose your fear is that uh, immigrants um first immigrants would retain their language but their their children wouldn't well sometimes that happens but of course it depends on the um the liveliness of the community well l l let me just say that joining us um this time from our studio in york in the north of england is jack mapanji uh, he's from a former british colony in africa from Malawi. He's now living in Britain in exile after spending three and a half years in prison for writing poetry that uh, greatly upset Malawi's former president, Hastings Banda. Um, Jack Mapanji, M Malawi also has English uh, as an official language. Um, when that happened, did that cause problems or resentment? It caused a lot of resentment. Um, not because um, um, Dr. Banda decided to make English as an official language, but Dr. Banda then went on to um, disregard all the other roughly Malawian languages, about nine of them, um, and um, effectively told people not to use them in official um, writings, for instance, um, except that they, they, they were allowed to use them in, um, in their homes. And so what happened was um, Dr. Banda then eventually sort of um, 
decided that he was going to you to, to to choose one of the dialects of the of one of the languages and um, chose that as a national language and the the aim there was to create a lot of uh, unity amongst the people so what you had was um, english as an official language which was spoken in parliament and in, in newspapers and in schools and so on and then um, the local language was um, declared as a national language chichewa uh, was used as um, um, an appendage to, to English. English, of course, is associated with um, many parts of Africa from uh, colonial times. Uh, aren't there great advantages in that? Well, English is... Um, we're talking about English as a global language. I'm afraid it's an elitist global language. And... Um, it's a good thing to, for people to write in English. I mean, it was in the early stages during the colonial period. Um, but immediately after independence, then African governments effectively and, um, and leaders had a choice. They can make a local language, and which is spoken by the greatest number of communities and so on and so forth. But the bigger problem is this. This is the pragmatic aspect of it. Um, we have joined the global community. We are now already talking about um, internet and um, communicating um, through computers and so all this sort of thing. Um, so, so that it's a shame, but, but that's the truth of, of, of the matter. Jack Mapanji, thank you very much indeed. He joined us uh, from our studio in York in the north of England. Well, one of the newest independent countries in Africa has uh, discarded two languages in favour of making English the official one, and that's Namibia. Joining us on the phone from Windhoek is the editor of the English language newspaper, the Namibian, Gwen Lister. Gwen Lister, are Afrikaans and uh, also German from the days of when it was a German colony, are they still widely spoken in Namibia? Well, certainly I'd probably say that Afrikaans is, is, is one of the most widely spoken languages in Namibia, uh, mainly because of the fact that in colonial times all Namibians were primarily educated in the Afrikaans language. So in, the, in terms of that, English is still fairly foreign in a lot of sectors of the country. On the other hand, of course, we have quite a large uh, German community here, which has ensured that German has certainly stayed alive and well, at least in those sections of the population. Why was English chosen, though, as the official language? Well, I think in many ways the sort of colonial regime's policy of, of, of three official languages, as it was German, Afrikaans and English, was a very unsatisfactory arrangement for most people. Generally speaking, Afrikaans was, of course, the most widely used. Afrikaans, in turn, even though most Namibians understand the language, was very much associated with the apartheid regime. And uh, German, of course, was similarly associated with the former colo uh, German colonial regime in Namibia. And I think the feeling was that English was more acceptable than the other two, although, of course, it is encouraged in the schools and so on, certainly at the lower levels, that mother tongue education is very, very important. And English has kind of been imported very slowly because it has been foreign. And also um, teachers haven't been trained in English. And, of course, there have been problems with the implementation of it. Gwen Lister, thank you very much indeed. Gwen Lister, who joined us from Vintuk in Namibia. Uh, Nicholas Osler, um, from what we've just heard, some of the African languages uh, your organization must be most concerned about. They seem to be uh, among the most endangered. Well, um, it's interesting that the a African case um, is quite different from in many other um, parts of the world because the main threatening languages there are not languages like English and French, which actually perform quite a useful role among the elites, of course, um, in enabling communication. The languages which are getting squashed um, in Africa are as being squashed by other languages like Hausa and Swahili, um, which are themselves indigenous African languages, but in fact probably relate to earlier African empires. But um, there's a lot of movement of populations in, in Africa even today, and these African languages tend to be the ones that win out. It's a very fraught situation in Africa, in fact. But a very important point that, uh, that Gwen was making was about the um, associations with languages. Um, English was acceptable because it's not associated with an oppressive regime in this case. Um, and we can see, I mean, this is very important in the way that languages do go together, not just with communication, but also with asserting your identity. 
And I think what we're going to find as English spreads, and I'm sure it will spread more, is that the identity associated with English is going to get, to get spread thinner and thinner and thinner, which may not be to the advantage of those who speak it as a native language. Well, m m most of you will remember how we recently picked up two words of Russian that uh, foreshadowed staggering political change in Eastern Europe, perestroika and glasnost. But According to one academic, since the collapse of communism, more than 10,000 English expressions have entered the Russian language. From Moscow, Marina Boutin reports. Even in Soviet times, English was the most popular language to be taught at schools. And although some teachers left much to be desired, by the end of their school life, the majority of pupils could conduct a basic conversation. The problem is very serious and important, not only in our country, but all over the world. Do it, please. Some sentences. We know about uh, the other cold, uh, which... Uh... But with the fall of the Iron Curtain, a great number of Russians have discovered that their level of English was insufficient. New possibilities in trade and traveling required much deeper knowledge of English, and all of a sudden, fluent English speakers were in great demand. Olga Subotina has been teaching English for more than 20 years. She says that over the past 10 years, the reasons behind learning English have drastically changed. I'm dealing with business students right now. They want to cooperate with their business associates, to understand contracts they're signing, and to read articles in business magazines. The secretaries I teach, they're mostly girls. They want to get a better job, to get better paid, so the main thing is to answer telephone calls and to read and write business letters. With demand came supply, and now Moscow alone can boast hundreds of schools which offer courses in English, or to be more precise, American English, for American notions are definitely here to stay. Shops are now called supermarkets. US dollars are bucks. And image makers and wonder bras are now as much part of Russian language as glasnost and perestroika. As for previously non-existent spheres like banking and finance, they consist entirely of English words pronounced in Russian manner. Audit, money transfer, cash. And while you are patiently waiting on the phone, a pleasant female voice tells you in Russian how much they appreciate your call. Something which sounds ridiculous to a Russian ear. Marina Bowden reporting from Moscow. Nicholas uh, Ostler, why is um, English apparently so easily absorbed into, uh, into other languages? I mean, our friends across the channel here, the, the French are constantly in a state of anxiety over what they call franglais invading their language. Well, I think it has been an advantage for English that we take a relatively relaxed view of um, what is good English and what isn't. But there's no reason to think that uh, English owes its uh, advantage in the world as it is at the moment to its structure or anything. And the highly inflected la nature of Latin didn't seem to stop its spread um, in the ancient world. Um, Chinese, um, with a rather different structure and a, a complicated tone system, managed to spread its way across most of East Asia, uh, a, a spread which may not yet have stopped indeed. Um, so um, I don't think that we can really look for structural features. And indeed, in the case of Russian itself, um, if you go to the opposite end of um, what was the Soviet Union, um, into the islands uh, on the Japan Sea, you will find um, mixtures of Paleo-Siberian languages with uh, Russian, which um, have, a, have a life all of their own. I just want to go uh, now to, a, to another part of um, what was part of the Eastern Empire. Uh, when the Berlin Wall was coming down and the Iron Curtain collapsing, um, some of you may remember we made a five-stop tour through Eastern Europe, meeting many people who'd improved their English over the past 40 years, uh, listening to the BBC, among them a businessman in Prague called Michael Horacek, who joins me again from Prague uh, on the telephone. I suppose in the past... Uh, Michael Horacek, uh, you were um, forced to learn Russian in your schools. Um, how much has that changed now? Well, dramatically indeed, because uh, learning English was really before the fall of the Berlin Wall, a, uh, somehow um, an ideological process, really, <laughs> you know. And uh, so, so there, there was some knowledge of, of English uh, before the revolution. Uh, but after, after our so-called Velvet Revolution, things uh, uh, really picked up speed and we were hit by an onslaught of, of English, especially American English.
very many uh, people started learning English, even not only the, the youngsters, but, uh, but people in their 40s, 50s, even 60s. And sometimes it, uh, it has <laughs> comical proportion, comic proportion, really. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the state of things has dramatically changed indeed. It's a, seen as a disadvantage, particularly in, in business, uh, like you, not to be able to speak English now, is it? Well, yes, uh, it, uh, it became a necessity, really, to, to be uh, not necessarily fluent in English, but at least to have some, some reading knowledge, because all the information, or all the books and all the materials that are coming from, from uh, what used to be the other world or the other Europe, uh, is normally printed or, or, or to be get in English. Michael Horacek, thank you very much for joining us. Michael Horacek, who was on the phone from Prague. We're, we're going to make our final call to the Asia-Pacific region, where both America and Britain have exercised huge influence in spreading the language. Well, Ian Simpson is the BBC correspondent in Singapore. Ian, um, what's the importance of uh, English as one of the official languages in Singapore? Well, in both Singapore and, in fact, throughout Southeast Asia, English plays a vital role. It's the language of business, and business is what, the make, what makes the world go round out here. It's also the language that uh, people in different governments use to talk to each other. It's uh, a language that's very commonly used in education, and increasingly it's the language well, there was a very strong campaign to speak Malay and not to speak English soon after independence. Um, but that, frankly, has been watered down because people have realized that in order to do business in the region, in order to do business with the rest of the world, and in order to have any kind of communication with the rest of the world, English is becoming so entrenched as a world language that people realize that, that learning Malay and refusing to speak anything but Malay simply kept people back. And what it's meant is that people from Malaysia who went overseas to be educated have got far further in business um, and got far further even in government than people who stayed at home and learned in Malay. I also noticed when I was in North Vietnam uh, a couple of years ago, where you've probably been as well, that uh, it's only the older generation who still retains French as their second language, uh, not young people. That's right. In fact, throughout Indochina, French is spoken by people over the age of 40, and anybody younger than that isn't remotely interested. Older people who were educated in French lycées and so on do still speak some fantastic French. In fact, some of the courtliest French I've ever heard, I've heard in Indochina. Um, but the young people in the cities particularly are interested in learning English and they spend their spare time. They go to evening classes, they go to weekend classes, they listen to the radio, they watch television. Everything they do, they do in order to pick up better English. Ian Simpson, thank you very much. Uh, he joined us from uh, our studios, our base in Singapore. Uh, Nicholas Ursler, let, let's just try and uh, sum all this up. I mean, really, the short answer is there's no turning back history what happened over centuries with our language being carried, as I was saying earlier, to every corner of the world. It's clear that English has benefited first from global imperialism uh, coming from um, Europe and secondly from the uh, um, revolutions in communication which have taken place in the 20th century and indeed have made English a bit more acceptable because they've been associated with a commercial power um, rather than an imperial power. But I think it is um, reasonable to point out that um, in the case of Singapore, for example, a lot of people retain um, Chinese competence there. Once uh, those Chinese markets come on stream, then they're going to um, have a bit more of a choice on their hands as to whether to communicate in English or in Chinese. Well, Mandarin's one of the four languages then. Yes, indeed. And um, it's, it's also worth pointing out that um, China has as yet um, not really shown its hand. It's still got a lot more people speaking Chinese in the world than we yet have speaking English. And uh, we really don't know what um, catastrophic changes there may be in the next century, which could well turn the tables on English. Nicholas Ostler, thank you very much indeed for joining us for today's programme. Let me just say to those of you who've been listening that uh, we very much welcome hearing your views. Uh, you know the address. You write to Outlook at BBC World Service, Bush House, Strand, London. Thank you very much for joining us. Same time tomorrow. Until then, from me, John Tidmarsh, goodbye. Next today, we have Multitrack Express. In half an hour, there's a bulletin of world news with sports roundup to follow. 
and then Lifeboat, which is a BBC English programme.